Our scripture lesson today is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 and 14 through 16. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. May God bless to our understanding this reading of today's holy word. What passes these days for exercise is my daily trip to the mailbox, if only because it forces me to change into daytime sweats and outdoor footwear. And once a month, I am distressed to find my copy of AARP magazine, formerly known by the oxymoronic title, Modern Maturity. With so many aging boomers, the magazine can now feature such newbies on its cover as Tom Hanks and Shania Twain. And it offers such titillating articles as The Real Man's Guide to Sizzling Barbecue, and Seven Ways Fitness Makes You Smart, Sexy, and Pain-Free, any one of which would be good, and marriage advice from Margot Thomas and Phil Donahue, as if marriage to Phil Donahue is a hard road to hoe. Last month, the magazine offered a free webinar on decluttering. All of us struggle to keep our homes neat and tidy, and during this pandemic lockdown, cleaning out has become a favorite activity. But beneath the usual everyday clutter, sometimes lurks the more insidious problem of hoarding, which is the indiscriminate stockpiling of ordinary and often useless items, including trash and spoiled food. One therapist calls it rubble without a cause. Hoarding is a growing problem that afflicts at least 6% of Americans. Approximately 25% of people threatened with eviction are hoarders. The compulsion, which may have some genetic ties, is often triggered by loss, grief, or trauma. Hoarders' houses become their bunkers from the outside world as hoarders isolate themselves in a world of squalor filled with relics of the past. They become impossibly entrenched in their own reality, separate and detached from sound and reasonable behavior. Two of the most famous hoarders were Homer and Langley Collier, two brothers who were immortalized by E.L. Doctorow. The brothers both graduated from Columbia University one as a lawyer and the other as an engineer and chemist who also performed as a concert pianist at Carnegie Hall. But eventually they barricaded themselves in their family mansion on Fifth Avenue and led reclusive lives until in 1947 their bodies were discovered under more than 100 tons of trash. One brother had died of starvation while waiting for the other brother to bring him food. The other brother was accidentally crushed by the debris from a booby trap he had created as a homemade security device. It's interesting to note that both brothers taught Sunday school 
at Trinity Church. Why, we wonder, do people live like that? Why are they so entrenched in the past and so paralyzed by change? Why do they defend their self-destructive attitudes with such ferocity? And why do they deprive themselves of the joy of being engaged with the world? The same can be asked of us in the church, and in fact is asked in today's reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Why, the Apostle Paul asks, do we in the church remain chained to outdated doctrine and dogma instead of drawn to dynamic and transformative change? Why do we choose to close ourselves off from the rich variety and texture of life just outside our sanctuary doors? The letter to the Ephesians was written in 80 AD or CE. That's nearly 2,000 years ago. This particular passage is part of the three-year lectionary cycle of readings for the church year, assigned to be read at exactly this time of the church year, and yet many of us have never heard it before. It's a piece of scripture that needs very little explanation. It's not a parable shrouded in symbolism or an event that needs to be put into historical context. The message is crystal clear, pure, and simple. It's also surprisingly, even shockingly, relevant. The theme is unity. We're not asked or advised or encouraged by the evangelist. No, we are begged, begged to lead lives filled with humility, gentleness, patience, and love, all in order to maintain the unity of the one spirit in the bond of peace. The word one appears seven times in two short verses. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Jesus promises a newly created order, a community that knows no barriers of race, class, or gender. It's a community for those who are denied acceptance or are judged inferior. And it unites rich and poor, educated and uneducated, healthy and sick, urban and rural, righteous and sinners. All are united through faith. And any effort to deny unity makes unity even more essential. As the great Sold Mahatma Gandhi said, our ability to reach unity and diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization. It's a unity that demands honesty and integrity and that uses truth to heal, not harm. Paul writes, we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow into Christ. Truth without love is cruel, and love without truth is an illusion. We as a society are held together by truth. In her classic book about lying, ethicist Cecile Bach warned that a society whose members aren't able to tell true messages from deceptive ones will soon collapse. Lying and deception are all tools used to restrict growth, freedom, and change. In his Nobel lecture, the Russian writer and dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, the simple act of any ordinary courageous person is not to support lies. Of course, there are many kinds of lies. There are malicious lies to humiliate others and exaggerations to stress our own superiority, half-truths mixed with misinformation to create confusion, and tacit lies that exist in silence to support what we know to be false. 
Then there are the white lies that are told to avoid embarrassment. Years ago, I lost a few pounds, and an enthusiastic parishioner exclaimed, wow, you look a lot better. And once when I got a haircut, my then boyfriend shook his head and said, you know, it was your best feature. In both cases, little white lies might have been preferable. Occasionally, lies are the lesser of two evils. In that case, the law of love overrides truth. But in the vast majority of cases, lying is just wrong. It's used to gain unfair advantage or to ex expand power and control or to evade laws. But the trust destroyed by such lies may never be restored. What began as the most famous truth-telling tale in America has itself become the most notorious lie. That of George Washington as a six-year-old, hatchet in hand, confessing to having hacked to bits his brother's beautiful English cherry tree. This charming and instructive anecdote first appeared in the 1806 book entitled The Life of George Washington by Parson Mason Locke Weems. The irony of the story is not only that it never happened, but also that it is plagiarized, and by a minister, no less. Imagine. The Reverend Mr. Weems saw fit to lift the tale from a story published seven years earlier in London. So for over 200 years, American school children have been taught to tell the truth by telling a lie in a plagiarized story. Cherry tree confessions aside, what Washington actually did say was that religion and morality are the indispensable supports of political prosperity to guard against tyrants. Gandhi, who led the nonviolent campaign for India's independence, wrote, there have always been tyrants, but in the end, they always fail, always, all through history, the way of truth and love has always won. The world is holy because God made it, and so is every one of us as well. To live toward that reality is little by little to become whole. That is our truth in love. That is our reality. God doesn't love us because we are special. We are special because God loves us. Let me repeat that. God doesn't love us because we are special. We are special because God loves us, all of us. God's love is a gift, not an achievement. And we are called to share that love, to love one another. That's the essential message of the New Testament, where the word love appears 538 times. Love is what binds us to God and to each other, bearing with one another in love, one body, one spirit. I believe that it is the church that gives form and expression to that love. Our church second congregational has a long, loud and proud history of expressing love through its bold stance for social justice, and its positions in favor of civil rights, gender equality, gay rights, and nonviolent protest. And it continues to express love through its job training program for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, through its gay and transgender support groups, through its divorce recovery workshops, and its seminars on racism, to name just a few initiatives. According to psychologists who specialize in stress management, in times of trauma, such as now, there is a longing for before times. The before times of nostalgia transport us to a safer, more innocent time in our lives. And that may work if you're a hoarder, trying to cut yourself off from the world. But 
It is antithetical to the life of faith. Nothing could be further from the truth, from God's truth, than the refusal to grow and to change. C.S. Lewis described it as being half-hearted creatures, fooling about with ambition when infinite joy is offered to us, like naive children who want to go on making mud pies in their backyard because they cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a day at the beach. The Apostle Paul persecuted Christians and was struck blind on the road to Damascus by the risen Jesus. But when his sight was restored, when the scales fell from his eyes, he realized that by persecuting others, he was persecuting the Son of God. Paul's restored sight signaled his awareness, his enlightenment, his growth and maturity, his transformation through faith. And he devoted the rest of his life sharing the message of truth in love. He became the first missionary and theologian of the Christian church. Behavior and beliefs that keep us anchored to the past contribute to our trauma because we are living a life apart and because in our heart of hearts, we know what is real and what is false. We know what is right and true and just. In our heart of hearts, we believe there is a more profound and inclusive order of justice than now exists. That there is something wider and deeper and more meaningful than ourselves that beckons us and that demands our respect and attention and unwavering support. It is unity that calls us, not avoidance or isolation. Unity based on God's truth in love. Unity of the whole. The partnership between the human and the divine, the vertical line of the divine, intercepting the horizontal expanse of human history to form the cross. On his deathbed, the great civil rights activist John Lewis wrote these words, the truth does not change. And that is why the answers worked out long ago can help you find solutions to the challenges of our time. Continue to build union between movements stretching across the globe. Let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. Amen. <laughs>